Usually, the only thing you get for finishing a video game is a sense of accomplishment. Or in some special cases, repetitive strain injury. But while a sense of accomplishment is nice, it has no real-world monetary value, which is a shame because there have been a handful of video games through the long and storied history of the medium that have offered real-world prizes to their very best players that range from cash to literal treasures to something life-changing, whatever that might be. I guess repetitive strain injury counts as life-changing? Anyway, consider these rare and special real-world prizes you could win by playing video games and without having to dedicate your life to becoming an eSports champion. Because who has the time? Now, when we released it, the first real question was, what is inside the cube? And I said, and I'm known for these things, I said there's something amazing inside, something life-changing inside. Well, this is what this video is about. Peter Molyneux is a game developer known mostly for two things. One, good games from the past, like the Fable series or Theme Hospital. Doctor requiring GP's office. And two, absolutely outrageous claims about features that will 100% not be in the finished version of his games. You've got to put these goggles on. Goggles? Put them on like this. Okay. What? Like that? Claire has been thrown a pair of goggles. Notice what she did. This wasn't acted. She felt the need to reach down for those goggles. Anyway, thanks to the second one, we were somewhat sceptical in 2012 when old P. Molly announced the first game from his new studio, 22 Cans. Called Curiosity, What's Inside the Cube, the idea of the game was that players would all work together to tap away at a big white cube, slowly reducing it in size until one lucky player would chip away the final cube to reveal what Pete described as a life-changing prize. You notice... <laughs> so... Someone's written some expletives on the, uh, on the cube. To be fair, it was a brilliant bit of marketing. The idea of a secret and valuable prize being hidden in the middle of this cube was definitely enticing. And I'll admit I did my time tapping away on that 3D square back in 2012 when I could have been enjoying the London Olympics or my youth. But on the 26th of May 2013, an 18-year-old Scottish man named Brian Henderson tapped Molyneux's cube for the final time and was greeted by this video in which it is revealed that what was inside the cube was in fact a tiny Peter Molyneux. And one lucky person has reaped the rewards of their hard efforts. How can anything be worth all that effort? As Peter goes on to explain, the life-changing prize in question was related to 22 Can's next game, the God Simulator Goddess. And so, what is in the center is something that only we can grant. And it is the ability to be a digital god. As a reward for his hard work tapping blocks, Henderson was to be named the God of Gods in Goddess, which I don't know what that means, and I'm not sure Peter does either. You, you, the person who would reach the center, will be the God of all people that are playing Goddess. You will decide, intrinsically decide on the rules that the game is played by. And, here's the life-changing bit, you will share in the success of the product. Every time people spend money on Goddess, you will get a small piece of that pie. Henderson was also to share in the financial success of Goddess, receiving 1% of the profits from the game, which sounds good, until he realised that the game never actually properly released, 22 Cans spent months ignoring Henderson's emails, and then Peter Molyneux announced in 2017 that the game had made no money and that Henderson would not be receiving anything. I absolutely love what I do. I love being a designer, I love making games that that aren't that are out there to play. Pretty bold of them to have uploaded this video to YouTube and kept it up long after it became apparent that it was all totally bullshit. now that I think about it. I bet they're getting absolutely roasted in the comments. Oh, yeah, probably a good idea, actually. Never mind an abstract and allegedly life-changing prize, here's a video game that allowed you to win a very real cash prize. And you didn't even have to leave the pub. 
Fans of the lost genre of arcade shooting games will be familiar with the Point Blank series, which swapped somewhat realistic shooting of terrorists and criminals for a series of colourful challenges that involved two characters who looked a bit like if Bert and Ernie had human skin. Well, that's Sesame Street ruined forever. There was, however, an extremely rare version of the Point Blank 3 arcade machine called Aim for Cash. This version of the game allowed you to build up prize money as you played, and if you managed to complete the near impossible final stage, you'd win real spendable money. Up to £40, which is enough to buy just over half a video game these days. That might sound like a relatively modest prize, but the developer's fatal mistake was making Aim for Cash, for the most part, still a game of skill. That meant players who were particularly good at Point Blank 3 and learned some of this version's unique exploits could keep playing over and over again, win hundreds of pounds and effectively empty the machine. One of the few ways your shooting skills can earn you money, beyond becoming a professional bank robber. Just to be clear, we're not suggesting you do that. All this is probably the reason why Aim for Cash is so rare and difficult to find in the wild these days. It's almost certainly the only coin-operated arcade machine out there that could actually lose the arcade operator more money than it earns them. Still, they could make that back and more by simply robbing a bank. They shouldn't, though. Obviously. I can't believe I'm still having to explain this. This is Chris Cashman, and I'm speaking to you from Microsoft Studios, where I host 1 vs. 100 on Xbox Live. 1 vs. 100 Live, where television meets video games. Live. For a brief shining moment at the end of the noughties, we had the Xbox 360 game 1 vs. 100, an online battle royale trivia game based on the TV game show of the same name. In 1 vs. 100, you either played as The One or as one of the 100 audience members, also known as The Mob. Everyone played as their custom Xbox avatars because in 2009, Xbox avatars were still a thing, long before Microsoft abandoned them all on a cold, dark server of eternal torment. Why did they program them to feel torment? Just seems cruel to me. Anyway, if you were the one, you had to do better at answering trivia questions than the 100, eliminating members of the mob by getting questions right where they got them wrong. But if you got one question wrong, you were out. So basically, Fortnite, only instead of guns, you had trivia, and instead of back bling, you had trivia, and instead of anthropomorphic bananas, you had trivia. Also, real prizes! I say real prizes, the top prize was 10,000 Microsoft points, as opposed to the TV show's top prize of $1 million. But still, back before Microsoft points were retired, that was like 125 bucks to spend on stuff in the Xbox store. 125! Win more prizes! If the mob won, on the other hand, the remaining members would split the winnings and each get an Xbox Live Arcade game. Also pretty sweet. These questions are all about video games. Thousands of fresh questions. Oh, I know this one. The experimental live game show video game hybrid was a bit of a hit, with over 2.5 million downloads in the first couple of months and some 200,000 players logging on to play every day. But then Microsoft canned it in 2010 after just two seasons. The tantalizing news for trivia fans still hurting over that cancellation is that as part of Xbox's FanFest event in October 2020, Xbox chief Phil Spencer hinted that hey, maybe the Xbox Series X could get a live trivia game in the vein of 1 vs 100 all of its own. Maybe we would, should even be building our own trivia game like from our past and uh, allow people to play a trivia game more often. Um, maybe that could uh... happen. Phil, that's all I needed to hear. Well, that and that you're going to release all of the Xbox avatars from their cold, dark cyber prison. They're suffering, Phil! The legendary game Wolfenstein 3D is known for a lot of things. Popularising the first-person shooter genre, launching the careers of famous game developers John Carmack and John Romero, teaching an entire generation of kids that it's okay to eat dog food off the floor. What? It's enriched with marabone jelly. What you might not know is that on release, Wolfenstein 3D, one of the most famous games in history, also had a secret real-world prize built into it. The way to win was to navigate a fiendish maze of near-identical square rooms hidden behind a secret wall in Episode 2, Level 8, and find this message. <laughs> 
The idea was that the first player to find their way to the room would win a copy of every game Apogee made for life by calling up Apogee's telephone support lines, back when video games had those, and saying the word Ardwolf. Presumably because the word Ardwolf is not something you'd ever say by accident. The only problem is this flawlessly conceived contest actually had to be cancelled before it was even officially launched. That's because as soon as Wolfenstein 3D was released, it was so immediately popular that map editing programs and cheat apps sprung up that would allow you to shortcut your way to the message. The worst part is the poor telephone support staff still had to hear the word Ardwolf bellowed down the phone at them over and over again for about the next decade. Hope they got a pay rise. They won't have got a pay rise. The thing is, were it not for these cheap programs and map editors, we reckon it genuinely would have taken quite a while for people to find this thing. In 2016, former Apogee employee Joe Sigler revealed on his blog a map that showed not just the extent of the maze of identical rooms, but also the complexity of the route required to find the hidden message. I don't know, that seems pretty hard, Wolfenstein. Hard wolf. I said it by accident. <laughs> On the surface, Trials Evolution is a fairly straightforward motocross game, where your goal is to either ride a little motorbike across some obstacles, or shatter your rider's pelvis in as creative a manner as possible. It is usually the pelvis one, yeah. However, there is a deeper game lying just under the surface of Trials Evolution, a ludicrously complex real-world riddle that makes the Da Vinci Code look like the Junior Jumble. It all started when Trials Evolution players noticed random letters written on signposts throughout the game. Cunning players translated these letters into a series of controller inputs via a sophisticated substitution cipher. The series of inputs, when performed under specific circumstances, unlocked an actual, original, properly recorded song. Wasn't this Finland's Eurovision entry in 2005? 12 points. Obviously, no one is just going to make beautiful music for its own sake, the very idea, so Trials fans immediately ran that song through a spectrograph and revealed another hidden message, this time in Morse code, which led to a website on which a series of symbols began appearing. Once players decoded a message written in these symbols to reveal a super cheery phrase predicting the eventual demise of the universe, that's when the real-world treasure hunt began. Entering that phrase produced a block of text instructing intrepid players to go to Helsinki, to enter a keypad-locked building, and to tell the intercom that you were there to find the Riddle Master. Which to me sounds like a pretty good way of getting yourself murdered by a Riddle-obsessed serial killer. In actual fact, the first person who did do this was given a map to the location of a cache of treasures in a Finnish graveyard, including an antique pocket watch and a small chest containing a key. The treasure also included coordinates leading to three other locations around the world. A cemetery in Bath, England, a hole in a wall underneath the Sydney Harbour Bridge in Australia, and a field in San Francisco where players found hidden treasure chests each containing a key and a mysterious plaque that read, It seemed like forever ago. On the reverse of the plaques, however, was the final piece of the puzzle, revealing the eventual location in time and space of the prize waiting for the indefatigable players who had come this far. It read, Midday in year 2113. First sat in org, one of five keys will open the box, underneath the Eiffel Tower. What's in the mystery box? We don't know, and the players who followed these threads won't know for another... 91 years! Trial's creative lead, Antti Ilvesuo, the creator of the riddle, has stated that he has made arrangements for there to be something for the people with the keys to open in 2113, seeing as he won't be there on account of being long dead. Honestly, it had better be something pretty bloody good considering all this build-up. Like a new gamer pick, or a trailer for Trials 8. Ooh, or some Microsoft points. Pretty sure they'll be back by then and the only stable currency. <laughs> On the face of it, Sword Quest is the laziest thing you could call a fantasy video game. It'd be like calling your FPS Gun Shooter, or a game in which you steal cars Grand Theft Auto. 
And yet, in the case of the ancient Atari 2600 game Sword Quest, the name was accurate, because by playing the game, you could participate in a real quest to win a series of real-world treasures, culminating with a gem-studded silver sword worth over $50,000, or $180,000 in today's money. Sword Quest was planned as a series of four games themed around the elements of Earth, fire, water and air, and required you to move through a series of labyrinths, collecting objects and placing others in rooms based on various world philosophies such as the Western Zodiac, the Kabbalah Tree of Life and the I Ching. Which sounds impressive, until you remember this game came out on the Atari 2600 and looked like this. <laughs> The real draw of Sword Quest, however, was the real-world prizes. Each game in the series contained clues that would reveal hidden messages in an accompanying comic book that came bundled with the game, and once you'd solved the puzzle, you could mail away to Atari for the chance to win one of Sword Quest's treasures, which included a gem-studded talisman, a platinum chalice, a solid gold crown, and the Philosopher's Stone, a large piece of white jade in a jewel-encrusted golden box. The four winners would then be entered into a final contest to win the grand prize, the Sword of Ultimate Sorcery, which had a silver blade and a gold handle covered in sapphires, emeralds, diamonds and rubies. Unfortunately for fans of blinged out blades, the video game crash of 1983 meant that cash-strapped Atari wasn't really in a position to be handing out solid gold crowns to people, and the Sword Quest series was cancelled along with the contest. Still, at least two lucky players did receive prizes. The Talisman, which was melted down so the winner could buy a new car, and the Chalice, which still exists in that winner's private collection. The fate of the other treasures remains a mystery, although given the amount of time that has passed, there are only two options. One, they got melted down, or two, the president of Atari secretly has them in his office and parades around with them in between meetings. It's one of the two. By mania, by mania. Give it a try, man. By mania. Another one from the 1980s here, where game designers seemed obsessed with the idea of hiding real-world treasure hunts in their games, again, possibly because the games look like this. This is Pie Mania, a 1982 British text adventure for the ZX Spectrum that featured puzzles, a weird mascot called the Pie Man, He seems nice, and on the B side of the game cassette, a truly bizarre theme song that I guess you were supposed to listen to while playing. Sadly, this was the British Eurovision entry in 1982. Nil point. The goal of Pymania was to find a golden sundial, but the twist was that this sundial actually existed in the real world. Players who figured out the clues to its location had to go there at a certain time, on a certain day of the year, where, they were told, they would meet the Pie Man himself, who would give them their prize of a golden sundial worth £6,000. Meet me at noon and I'll be there With gold and diamonds very rare Although it took three years, the prize was eventually claimed in 1985 by two women who figured out the clues that led them to the Littlington White Horse in East Sussex, where, according to a contemporary games magazine, the famous pie man clambered out from a clump of bushes and to the strains of his own signature tune presented the two lucky ladies with the coveted golden sundial. Which honestly sounds like something out of a horror film, especially when you see the photograph of what a life-size pie man actually looks like. To try, man. I would pay £6,000 not to have to be anywhere near that, thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching this video about the real world prizes you could win in video games. Um, if you'd like to watch some more videos, we've got another couple up here which definitely won't involve me eating dog food, I can promise that. Uh, and if you'd like to like and subscribe, that would be great, super helps us out. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I need to get through a load more of these cans to be in with a chance of winning a grooming set. Lovely. Mm. At least I'm getting complete nutrition in jelly.